This video is brought to you by Milanote, a visual tool to get organized and stay creative. Free link in the show notes. When I first saw Interstellar, I can't say that I really understood the science behind it. Much land or one is spent, TARS will detach. Get sucked right into that black hole. Why does TARS have to detach? Oh, well, we have to shed the weight to escape the gravity. Newton's third law. What I did understand was the emotion. Cooper, you can't ask Tars to do this for us. He's a robot, so you don't have to ask him to do anything. The complexity of it is something that I don't think the audience would be able to grasp while they're watching the film. But if we knew what the rule set was and how it would work mathematically, that the audience would feel a logic behind it. Now that I rewatched the film closely to analyze the editing, I realized that the rules behind it are solid. Goodbye, Tars. Goodbye, Dr. Grant. See you on the other side, Coop. See you there, Slick! Ranger 2, prepare to detach. What? No! No! Cooper! Three. Cooper, what are you doing? Cooper, the main character, sacrificed himself so that the other astronaut can find a new planet for humans to survive. It's a death sentence. As he gets sucked into a black hole, his ship disintegrates. A black hole consumes everything. Light, space, time. Its gravitational field is infinite. Uh. None of the known laws of physics apply inside a black hole. But instead of imploding, Cooper enters a mysterious tesseract. <sighs> a three-dimensional shadow of an unfolded four-dimensional hypercube that otherwise is beyond our understanding. Sometimes, when you get a really good artist and a compelling story, you can almost achieve that thing that's impossible, which is entering the consciousness of another human being. <laughs> this scene in Interstellar took me to a place that very few films ever do anymore. It took me back to the feeling that I had as a child when I saw my first few films on a big screen. It's like the film holds the answer to how we exist and what will happen to us when we don't anymore. Looking at every cut, I created a visual board of anything that I noticed and eventually arrived at Murph's room to be the key to the film's structure. This is the location that connects us to the Tesseract through time and space. There are six scenes that take place in Murph's room prior to the third act climax with Cooper inside the Tesseract. Notably, he witnesses seven moments as he skips through the Tesseract to access multiple points in his daughter's timeline. And there's a reason. Cooper. Come in, Cooper. Sorry. He survived. Somewhere. But first, let's look at the six scenes with his 10-year-old daughter, who is convinced that her room inhabits a ghost. This is 14 minutes into the film that we get introduced to this really important location. Nice little dolly in. Nothing special about which book. I've been working on it. Why? In case the ghost is trying to communicate. I'm trying Morse. Morse? Yeah. Dots and dashes used to... I know what Morse code is, Murph. I just don't think your bookshelf's trying to talk to you. Isn't it amazing how Matthew McConaughey just mumbles his lines? Okay, so this is number one. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna look for the next scene. And then we're gonna call this Murph's room number two. Sand falling to the ground. It's a specific pattern here. The ghost. Grab your pillow. Sleep in the town. This progression of time, this is like the next day. She wakes up, it's gonna be Murph's room number three. It's not a ghost. Now we again have progression of time. I'll count this as a new scene. It's not Morse, Murph. It's binary. Thick is one, thin is zero. Coordinates. So far, all four scenes were about plot. And really, it's just two beats. One, there's a ghost. Two, the ghost sends a message. We're gonna figure out the coordinates to NASA. The purpose is to get Cooper on the space mission and Murph to meet her future employer, NASA. He wanted to go alone, but she goes along. She hides in the truck. 
They explain to him the mission. He needs to go into a wormhole that was created by somebody artificially so that they can go to a different galaxy and find a new Earth-like planet that they can escape to. Because Earth is going down and they need to get off it. Now the last two scenes in her room are about emotion. Now he has to tell his daughter that he's leaving. The pivotal scene. And we don't really know what's blocking the door. And they don't get to fight over him leaving just yet. Oh. That's delayed to another scene. If you're leaving, just go. This is a good narrative. You don't want to resolve things too fast. You want conflict to linger. That creates tension and engagement. Tom will be all right, but you got to make things right with Murph. And then the next morning he returns. Now we get the answer. She put her desk in front of the door. The emotional core of the film is about a father who is sacrificing the relationship with his daughter. You have to talk to me, Mark. For the remote chance of saving the human species. I figured out the message. It says, stay, Dad. This raises two dramatic you questions. Look at the books. Look at this. It says, stay. Why One, will he ever come back? It says, stay. I'm coming back. When? Two. Will their love survive? One for you, one for me. When we get back, we're gonna compare. I mean, by the time I get back, we, we might even be the same age. You and me? What? Imagine that. This is the final scene with her in this room as a kid. No idea. Oh! Don't make me leave like this, Murph. And these six scenes we're gonna revisit when we get to the Tesseract. Almost two hours later into the film in Act 3, Cooper makes the ultimate sacrifice for the good of the mission, which gets him stuck inside the Tesseract in what appears to be some form of afterlife. Christopher and his brother, he wrote completely new rules for fourth dimensions, fifth dimension, space time, and then, you know, following through on those rules in our final third act of this world that he's created that is incredibly abstract. And in the center of it though, the heartbeat, is a, uh, a father faced with the fact that his daughter thinks that he abandoned her. Love is that fifth dimension. Love is that thing that travels through time, forward, backwards, up and down. Okay, seeing the room. So this is a scene that we haven't seen. This happened before the movie started. The one scene that we hadn't seen in the film before is when he first pushes on the books and causes the toy spaceship to fall. We only saw the aftermath of that when Murph arrives in the kitchen early in the film. Dad, can you fix this? What the heck did you do to my lander? It was me. It was your ghost. So technically this moment here happened after this moment right here. I'm gonna call this Murph Zero. <laughs> With this moment, Cooper starts figuring out that he can see into her room and manipulate objects. And then we're intercutting to present time when she puts that back. He doesn't see this. He sees this. This is the past that he's seeing, but that's intercut with her now in present time, what I call present time. His point of view, her memory of it, back to him. Very interesting, there are three layers of reality going on here. This should be down here, this is present time. This should be up here, this is in the past. Once I realized that we're dealing with three different time layers, plus her memory, I began to break up the edit and move the shots literally onto different layers according to their story time. I think now I figured it out. We're gonna continue building this structure. At the end of it, we're gonna be able to really see the pattern of how this was cut. I haven't yet addressed the concept of space and time in this film. One of the most startling consequences of relativity is any moving object slows down in time relative to a stationary observer. So while it took Cooper only a few months for his space mission that ultimately got him stuck in the Tesseract, for his daughter this took 23 years. She is now in present time basically the same age as her father. As you can tell, I finished breaking down the Tesseract scene into the three different video layers according to the time layers. The scene in total is 13 and a half minutes long. You can see that the top layer, this is all the stuff that takes place inside the Tesseract with Cooper. That's the bulk of the scene. It's intercut with 
the past. So this is what he's seeing through the shelf. And then it's also intercut with Murph now being fully grown up. So now he's traveling through the Tesseract to a different time. And you can see sort of these ripple effects where he sees a moment and it ripples through time. So if you look very closely at the door, it's closing here and then it's closing just a fraction of a second later. There's a slight delay. We're in the present. Okay, this is kind of like the ticking time bomb. We're intercutting to her co-worker who's outside there and he's monitoring the fire because she started a fire to deter her brother who didn't allow her to go back into the house. This is really just to add more drama that we're intercutting between the co-worker. The fire is about to be extinguished. The brother is going to come back. Hurry up, that kind of stuff. <gasps> So, so far, the first part of this Tazarek scene, as we're intercutting, it's about a father leaving his daughter and him trying to influence the past. He's trying to make her convince the father in the past to stay. Make him stay, Merv. And this leading to the emotional climax. Now let me leave, Merv. This is what we call the dark night of the soul in storytelling. This is where... Don't let me leave, Murph! The main character is facing its darkest moment and is about to give up. No! 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 And this is kind of the center of the Tesseract scene here. And we're moving into a completely new phase. Here's a story turn. You were my ghost. She is starting to realize that the ghost was her dad. And then notice this big chunk here where we don't intercut at all. Before we get to the climax of the Tesseract scene and Chris Nolan's genius story turn, I want to thank Milanote for their support. I use their visual boards to organize my research on Interstellar. The flexible drag and drop interface allowed me to arrange my findings in whatever way made sense to me and change it around as I made new discoveries. It's the ultimate digital pin board that enables you to add and modify text, pictures, links and draw connections. For example, as I was watching Interstellar, I would take time-coded notes on my board and added screenshots of key scenes that could be potential beats in my analysis. This served as a quick reference as I was going back and figuring out my script. I used to do my video research and scripting in a Google Doc. No more. This is better because it's visual. You can add boards within boards, create task lists and share it with your collaborators. To organize, experiment and build your next idea or project, sign up now for free by using my link in the video description. Now back to Interstellar and how Cooper overcomes the dark night of the soul. Right. This is kind of the midpoint of the scene. He survived. Somewhere in their fifth dimension. So far, we're kind of just really dealt with the emotion of the scene. Now we're going back into the plot, revealing that TARS, the robot, is actually still living somewhere inside the black hole. They saved us. Huh. What the hell is they? And that's why they want to help us, huh? I don't know, but they constructed this three-dimensional space inside their five-dimensional reality to allow you to understand it. Well, that ain't working. This is yes, just is. dialogue for the audience. You've seen that time is represented here as a physical dimension. You have worked out that you can exert a force across space-time. The good thing about it is, as we learn about the Tazarek, our main character is learning that there's a purpose to this construct. Gravity can cross the dimensions, including time. Apparently. Do you have the quantum data? TARS was originally sent into the black hole to record an otherwise unattainable set of quantum data that is critical for solving a gravity problem to build a space station so that the human species can survive. And TARS has the data now. Roger, I have it. It's interesting, it's all on his face. I am transmitting and on all wavelengths, but nothing is getting out, Cooper. I can do this. I can do this. To such complicated data to a child. Not just any child. He's realizing that he can use the Tazarak to communicate back in time. Murph, the fire's out! Come on! 
It's interesting that they intercut Merv and then her co-worker right here. This just adds extra tension, make it feel like she only has a limited amount of time to figure out what she needs to do to save humanity. Even if you communicate it here, she won't understand its significance for years. Uh, I get that, Tars. All right, but we, we've got to figure something out, all right? The people on Earth are going to die. Think, think, think. Cooper, they didn't bring us here to change the past. Staying in the close-up for this. Say that again. They didn't bring us here to change the past. I love this moment. The editor and Christopher Nolan give the audience a chance to figure this out for themselves. They didn't bring us here to change the past. The key word here is they. And he realizes now in the close-up as well. And they didn't bring us here at all. We brought ourselves. So the biggest twist in the film, we get this revealed in this big shot that is 41 seconds long and it's playing all in his face. And they didn't bring us here at all. We brought ourselves. And then he moves away. Big turning point here, there's new hope because now he understands this is not just what could potentially be the final flashes in his death. This is a physically constructed space for him to actually fulfill a mission. Could be the coordinates for NASA in binary. Roger, so he's traveling in time again, but this time he's actually traveling back because the coordinates were revealed before she wrote the message stay. So this is like Murph room number two. It's not a ghost. She remembers that line. It's gravity. It's gravity. I brought myself here. We're bringing along the rest of the audience. We're here to communicate with a three-dimensional world. We're the bridge. The longer this moment goes on, the more information is being fed to the audience. At this point, probably 60% are already fully understanding what's going on, but we want to bring along everybody. I thought they chose me. So we're now way into the second part of the scene, and now it's all about plot. They didn't choose me, they chose her. For what, Cooper? <laughs> to save the world. Now he's traveling in time again. It's infinitely complex. They have access to infinite time and space, but they're not bound by anything. Bringing us along, telling us what we're seeing. That's why I'm here. I'm gonna find a way. How, Cooper? Love, Tars, love. My connection with Murph, it is quantifiable. It's the key. Okay, this is like the magical premise of the film, is that love is what enables them to connect through time and space. The watch. Tars, translate the data into Morse and feed it to me. Okay, so now he's executing on the new plan. And the watch, what a great tool to use to communicate the quantum data because obviously the watch represents time and he's communicating through time. Murph, I can see his car! Taking time he's bomb. Coming, okay. She's leaving. She's not gonna get the message. So we have that last moment. Oh, this might all fall apart. Roger Morse's dot dot dash dot. There's a little bit of an artistic license that we now have to take. He sent the message while the clock was still on the bookshelf. We just kind of have to now assume the clock just keeps on repeating the message. Murph, who struggled with her father's decision to abandon her, now finally understands that he always loved her and sacrifice their time together in order to save her and everyone else. She's writing down the quantum data, she's including it into her formula. So the mission is completed, she solved the riddle. The bulk beams are closing the Tesseract. And we're ending the scene in the Tesseract. They're not beings, they're us. Cooper, people couldn't build this. No, not yet. But one day. A civilization that's evolved past the four dimensions we know. What happens now? And we're out. Hard cut, he's now somewhere in space. 
Okay, as you can tell, there is like this middle part here, which is really for him to understand that there is a higher purpose, that everything that he's done has a reason. No, you cannot go back in time, but gravity and love can send messages back in time. If you kind of go along with this, it makes sense. Very beautifully executed. This is unpredictable to me. And as I was watching the film, I really felt like I'm discovering something magical. Narrative should always be plausible, but surprising. When filmmakers write, shoot and edit their films, it's a continuous process of discovery. For me, refining the sequence was all about the emotional side. And then as we came to actually execute it, that's where the mathematical design of these concepts and how we were going to portray this rather fantastic geometry, that became the whole focus of, of that part of the process. There were quite a few more editing and filmmaking nuggets that I discovered. Christopher Nolan chose to not have like fancy camera moves around the spaceship. He attached the camera to the Ranger. And this is a much more realistic view of what you would be seeing if you see any mission from NASA. And this creates authenticity. This feels more real. Check out the Patreon bonus story where I show the most important takeaways from the other scenes of Interstellar. Plus an exclusive link to my research board I created with Milanote. Link in the video description. Thanks for watching and happy editing.